Welcome and good evening to all colleagues and members of Indian Gola Yohansi Swadayis from wherever you are. Believe you are all keeping absolutely fine. Well, this particular webinar is our 148th webinar in succession. If you look through any of the database or the literature, you can't see anybody anywhere in the world has conducted more than 100 webinars in succession. That we, we crossed over. We crossed over and this is the 148 quality webinars which people are longing to hear on every Wednesday evening. The next week, 149 will be a case discussion probably a, some sort of English or a higher examination style case discussion going to be handled by Dr. Rajiv Kishan. He's an examination to Australia, New Zealand, and Malaysia universities. Under 150, that is our bumper of 150th webinar. It's a global webinar. Most of the contents are participating. And for everybody's industry, we are picking the topic as a modern machines and accessories in anesthesia, which we use. And you will be hearing more things through that particular webinar. Kindly attend. Do not forget. Mark your diary, please. Friends, ICA Conference 2023. Well, our annual conference goes on every year. And since last four years, we make it as international since we have association with the American Society as well as Royal College and Society for Amelity and Anesthesia. This year, we're going to do it at Narayan Hridayalaya, Bangalore and hotel connected to Narayan Hridayalaya at Sai Vishram because the conference will be spread over at two different places. And on two, three, four, and five of November, two will be workshops which will be conducted various major colleges at Bangalore town. So please prepare to attend this particular quality conference. And if any of you are interested to participate academically in this particular conference, kindly inform the conference organizers or to ICA. Friends, today's webinar is a special webinar and we're going to do it on trauma management. Well, you all heard about the trauma management. You all know to some extent. Unfortunately, trauma still remains as a major killer of the mankind. Till last year, it was occupying the fourth place. Now it is pushed down to fifth. Anyway, trauma even now is a major problem for all of us. Unfortunately, in the developing countries like us, as well as in the undeveloped countries. Well, the road rage scan respect the traffic laws and poor road conditions <laughs> and our sense of understanding about good driving are more this particular issue more comfortable. And in this particular program, we are discussing on pre-hospital management, hospitalized management when you see a patient first, and then what you could do in the operating rooms, as well as the ICU management and rehab. There's a slight difference in the handling of this particular webinar. This webinar is totally handled by people who are rather well used to the trauma work day in and day out. They are all our army friends from the Indian Medical Corps. Colonel Vigas, Colonel Krishna, Colonel Suresh, and Colonel Altia. Well, moderated by one of our own friends, ex-major, 
doctor divesh arora divesh arora is known to you he works as director and head of the department at asian hospitals delhi and he is an nabs national board as well as a green ot assessor and is examined to national board as well as the medical accounts and he is an accepted teacher and accomplished and as this always and he will be the main moderator of the day and he will be introducing every particular discussion of this particular webinar one by one as a ten comes and something more which i would like to say is that well you know the college is running certain courses course on ultrasound course on cardiac anesthesia pediatric cardiac anesthesia on oncology anesthesia and on liver transplants well our next session of the course starts on july 1st and the advertisement the notification of the courses probably will be out next week and the selection will be in june this is for session starting in july and watch out for the notification and people who are interested please go ahead with the course and you know about our yearbook of anesthesia sorry one of the other quality publication in india which is selling maximum numbers in india well 2022 yearbook is all day available 23 is going to be released during our next conference Dr. Mughal Kabo, who also is an ex-Indian Army comrade, he is the editor of our yearbook. And with this comment, sir, I request Devesh Arora to open up today's webinar. Kindly introduce each speaker and give your comments on the post, and we will be watchful of what is happening around. And wish you all best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for delivering such a wonderful welcome address. Now, sir, I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Devesh Arora. Over to you, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir, for the kind introduction. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to be moderating this webinar on trauma management. Uh, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Colonel Vikas Chavla, uh, who is a senior advisor in Department of Anesthesia at Base Hospital, Delhi, CAN. His areas of interest include science of resuscitation, DLS, ACLS, ATLS, and emergency medicine and regional anesthesia. He has a couple of publications to his credit. Uh, over to Colonel Vikas Chabla for enlightening us on the pre-hospital management of trauma patients. Over to you, sir. Dr. Vikas, can you unmute yourself and uh, share your screen, please? Uh, can you unmute yourself, Dr. Vikas? Not able to unmute. Nani, no, no, you have, uh, you are now unmuted. Please start sharing your screen, sir. Mm -hmm. Colonel Vikas. Excuse me, sir. Uh, can you stop screen share and redo screen share again?
um, apologies for this technical glitch. As of now, there is some internet issues with Colonel Vikas Tabla. He's trying to re-log in. So I request everyone to kindly bear with us another two minutes. He'll be logging in again. Dr. Vikas, can you start uh, sharing your screen, please? Yeah. Can you see the screen, please? Yes, it's visible. Can you switch over to the slideshow, please? It's visible, the slideshow. Yes, now it's visible. Sir, please start. Okay. So at the outset, uh, uh, sincere apologies for what happened just two minutes back. And uh, uh, very, uh, I bring good evening and greetings from my hospital, that is Base Hospital Telecan. Uh, very good evening to the esteemed guests and faculties out there, many of whom I know, Dr. J. Sri Zhu, Dr. Radha Krishna. Thank you for all, all having us here. And thank you for my, to my dear friend, uh, Suresh, who has given me this opportunity to talk about pre-hospital trauma care of a trauma patient. So it's a complex topic. However, I try to uh, give it justification as much as possible in this 20 minutes given to me. How do you define injury? Well, injury is defined as a bodily lesion at the organic level resulting from acute exposure to energy, which can be mechanical, thermal, electrical, chemical, or radiant, in amounts that exceed the threshold of physiological tolerance. Well, uh, Dr. Radha Krishna just spoke about the gravity of trauma in India as, as of today. It's the third commonest cause of death in all ages. It comes at a cost, and the cost is about 3% of GDP. It is truly the disease of the young, well, if I were to die in India, on Indian roads, there will be 16 ch chances, 16 ch higher, higher mortality for me to die on Indian roads than, on, than in USA. On an average, one person dies every five minutes. So it is very apt to say that injury is a silent genocide. So trauma, as we all know, it's a continuum of care starting from injury prevention up to disability or recovery. But why we are interested over here is that time is critical during the pre-hospital care, which is phase three in the slide. The American College of Surgeons has come up with the field triage guidelines in 2021. It has got red criteria patients and yellow criteria patients. The red criteria patients are, are basically looking at the anatomy and the physiology. The few examples, this is downloadable, so I'll not spend extensive time on this. The few things which I can highlight in the anatomy part, that is injury patterns, is penetrating injuries to head, neck, torso, and proximal extremities, skull deformity, suspected skull fracture, crushed, degloved, mangled, or pulsary extremity. What about the physiology? So all patients, if the GCS, motor GCS is less than six, patient is unable to follow the commands. The respiratory is less than 10 or more than 29. Room air pulse oximetry is less than 90%. And for all the, all the age groups starting from zero to 65, blood pressure and heart rate have thresholds to determine whether this patient goes to which center. In any case, all the red criteria patients, depending on anatomy and physiology, they are transferred to the high, highest level care of trauma center. But then what about the yellow category? The yellow category criteria for transfer of the patients looks at mechanism of injury and the judgment given by the emergency medical services. So few examples of mechanism of injury are high risk auto crash, for example, partial or complete ejection, a pedestrian bicycle rider, rider thrown over, fall from a height for, of 10 feet for all ages. As far as the EMS judgment, is concerned, they look at whether the patient was taking anticoagulant use, whether the patient was of extremes of ages, pregnancy more than 20 weeks. 
So all these patients, they preferably be, be sent to trauma center, but again, at the same time, it need not, need not be the highest level of care. So a case scenario we'll discuss out here. Now case scenario, when we talk about pre-hospital trauma life support or advanced trauma life support is always given in MIST format. So what is MIST? MIST is M stands for mechanism of injury, I stands for the injury, injury sustained by the, by the victim, S stands for the signs and symptoms, and T is the treatment given. So here in, we have a hypothetical case where a 45-year-old man, a non-restrained passenger, got ejected from his car and is found lying on the road following a motor vehicle crash from behind. So this is mechanism. Injury. He has sustained lower extremity trauma with bleeding from the amputated right limb with multiple abrasions over the anterior chest wall. So this is the injury sustained by the victim. Signs and symptoms. He is conscious, alert, and yelling for help. Treatment. None reported. Why I'm saying treatment non reported because it's a usual scene that we, we don't stay and play. We scoop and run with the patient. And that's why probably no treatment was given for this patient. So if I, if I were to ask you a question, as a pre-hospital care provider, you are asked to rescue this patient from the scene. What should be your priorities in assessing the patient? Well, pre-hospital care looks at the holistic concept. We need to transfer the right patient at the right place at the right time. And therefore, the pre-hospital care has to be quick and safe. Preferentially, all the transfer, all the patients should be transferred to a trauma center, but in actuality, it does not occur. They are transferred to the nearest medical facility. The priorities of uh, transfer in uh, of, of care in 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 uh, pre-hospital care would be obviously scene assessment followed by primary survey followed by resuscitation, intervention if required, triage, and initial transport. When you talk about safety, we forget that safety of the provider is the first and the foremost, followed by the safety of the scene, and lastly, the safety of the patient. Primary assessment is always carried out the ATLS way. That, that, that is the ABCDs we all know of, which means science has proven beyond doubt that airway kills before the problems of B, the problems in breathings, they do kill because pro before problems of C, circulation, and then only after resuscitation, we should assess the two GCS of the patient. So when I approach the patient as a paramedic in India, I take a quick relevant history, do a 10 second assessment to see whether how good or bad is the ABCs. At the same time, I need, give, I need to give priority to cervical spine motion restriction. Cervical spine motion restriction guidelines have been best practices adopted by the American College of Surgeons. So they say that acutely altered level of consciousness, that is example GCS less than 15, evidence of intoxication should have a collar on and entire spine as well, midline neck or back pain and or tenderness, focal neurological signs with or without symptoms, that is numbness or motor weakness, anatomic deformity of the spine and distracting circumstances circumstance like fracture femur. Well, airway management, we should not forget the spine. It comes with a caveat. Airway management goes along with C-spine protection. So because spine motion restriction is the word used these days. Suctioning is of prior, is of vital importance. If you see, you want to, you will be opening the mouth some uh, at some time. And if you see secretion, they have to be sucked out. Jaw thrust is the preferred maneuver rather than head tilt and chin lift. Oxygen mask with reservoir, reservoir bag is used most often than not along with bag and mask ventilation. And one must prepare for definitive airway if, if indications are there. Coming to the breathing, breathing comes with a caveat of ventilation. So we need to see the jugular venous distension and tracheal deviation. Visually assess the injury, symmetry of the chest, parietal chest movement, that is, and auscultate for breath sounds and heart sounds. At the same time, we palpate the chest for pain, crepitus, and subcutaneous air. The life-threatening injuries in B should be identified, and they will be touched upon by the subsequent speaker. Coming to circulation. Circulation comes with hemorrhage control. We check the pulse, 
skin status, capillary refill time, sensorium. A cool and clammy patient is always thought of as being in shock until it's proven otherwise. White bore IV should be taken. Pre-warm crystalloids in the form of Ringer lactate, normal line in aliquots of 500 ml should be given and patient reassessed. What about the disability? The disability in trauma is never the disability we know of that is orthopedic disability. It is a neurological disability. So we resuscitate and then assess the two GCs of the patient. At the same time, we see for lateralizing signs, size of pupils that is. Exposure and environment is very, very important because it is definitely a part of the lethal triad we know of. That is, it can contribute to acidosis and coagulopathy per se. And therefore, all clothes are removed because we, we want to see the patient in the totality. However, we want to prevent hypothermia. Once we examine the patient, we cover the patients up as much as possible. Patient is also log rolled before transportation and documentation need not be forgotten. So we'll see a video how exactly one goes about helmet removal, which is one of the priorities for a paramedic back home in India as well. It takes at least two people to remove a helmet from a patient while maintaining the patient's head and neck in a neutral position. One person stabilizes the patient's head and neck from the head of the bed by placing one hand on either side of the helmet. This position prevents slippage once the helmet strap is loose. The second person loosens the helmet strap at the D-rings or fastener. If the helmet has a face cover, that must be removed first. Then they place one hand anteriorly on the patient's mandible at the angle, with the thumb on one side and the fingers on the contralateral side. With their other hand, they apply pressure from under the patient's head at the occipital region taking care not to flex or extend the neck. This maneuver transfers the responsibility for inline immobilization to the second person who is at the side of the bed. The first person at the head of the bed then expands the helmet laterally to clear the ears and carefully removes it. If the helmet provides full facial coverage, the patient's nose will impede helmet removal. To clear the nose, the helmet needs to be tilted backward and raised over the patient's nose, taking care not to bend the neck. During this process, the second person maintains inline immobilization from below to prevent head tilt. After the helmet is removed, inline manual immobilization is reestablished from above, and the patient's head and neck are secured. Nice. Coming to hemorrhage control, hemorrhage control <clears throat> assumes the second most common cause of death in trauma after traumatic brain injury. And therefore, for a pre-hospital care provider, we almost always follow the XABCD approach. What is X, X, examinating hemorrhage? We have to check as we discussed before the clinical features suggestive of hemorrhage. And we follow an algorithm that is direct pressure, wound packing, compression restraints, Elastic wrap and finally tourniquet. Let's watch this video. How do we go about tourniquet control? As discussed in the directions for using videos, the key to successful use of combat gauze is to pack the gauze into the wound deeply so that it comes into contact with the source of bleeding. You must also pack enough gauze into the wound to completely fill any open space. A large wound might require you to use more than one combat gauze. Don't forget to check for an exit wound or additional wound. Any excess gauze should be used to apply pressure over the wound for at least three minutes. After at least three minutes of pressure, ensuring bleeding has stopped, apply a pressure dressing over the combat gauze to maintain pressure and to protect the wound from further contamination. In rare instances, active bleeding may continue even after your initial application of combat gauze. The problem cause of this is failure to place the hemostatic agent into contact with the source of bleeding. In the event that prior attempts at stopping bleeding were ineffective due to improper product placement or other factors beyond the caregiver's control, 
Any combat gauze or standard gauze in the wound should be removed. Excess pool blood should be swept away. The point of bleeding should be visualized if possible. And a fresh combat gauze should be packed into the wound consistent with the product instruction. Remember that once the new combat gauze is packed into the wound, you must still apply at least three minutes of pressure before proceeding with the application of a pressure dress. So uh, we, after that, we move to combat application tourniquet. This is used by our paramedics, Pan India. So anatomy of cat is obviously important. We have a strap, we have a band, we have a clip, and we got a rod. The, the whole issue, idea about this is that it is small and lightweight, and one person is able to apply on its own hand. It, and it completely is able to apply the arterial flow in an extremity. So we shall see the video how the tourniquet is applied. We're going to talk about the combat application tourniquet or cap. Important thing to remember is this should always be accessible. Your life or your buddies can depend on it. First thing you want to do is obviously route your own extremity through the tourniquet. Put the tourniquet as high as possible. Tighten using the tightening strap so three fingers can't fit underneath the strap easily. Take the tightening rod, tighten until bleeding stops. Secure the tightening rod and the securing clip. Check your pulse to make sure you've occluded the blood flow. Finish routing the strap through the securing clips. And secure using the safety strap. Don't forget to mark time of application. Okay, so life threatening bleeding, bleeding, exactly what do you mean by that? It's a pulsatile or steady bleeding from the wound, or you find the blood is pooling on the ground. The overlying clothes are soaked with blood. Bandages or makeshift bandages, which were used to cover the wound, are ineffective and they become soaked with blood again. There is traumatic amputation of the arm or leg, and there was prior bleeding, and the patient is now in frank shock. What are the mistakes, tunicky mistakes, which, which, have, which have taken place over the years? Not using one when you should. Using a tourniquet for minimal bleeding, putting it on too proximal, taking it off when the casualty is in shock, not making it tight enough should eliminate the distal pulse as we know, not using a second tourniquet if needed, waiting too long to put the tourniquet on, and last but not the least, periodically lose the, losing the tourniquet to allow blood flow to the injured extremity. What about tranasemic acid? Yes, it has stood its test of time since the crash 2 trial has come. But yes, it should be used judiciously and ideally when the trauma has taken place within the three hours of with trauma, the transport time, uh, the trauma exactly has taken place within the three hours. Three hours. So, and there's a high level, uh, level evidence supporting its use. The dose is one gram, which has to be given over a period of 10 minutes. An implementation in the pre-hospital setting offers a survival ad advantage, particularly when evacuation to surgical care may be delayed. Pelvic binder also has been used and is being used by the paramedics, especially if you are suspecting pelvic fracture because it does no harm. And you're suspecting pelvic, pelvic fracture and you don't have a marketed pelvic binder, it's better to apply the, uh, the bed sheet. The idea is to cover both the greater trochanters and wrap it tight enough before transport. Same thing applies to splinting also. The thomas splint is commonly used for transport, and splinting and putting a putting a, a pelvic binder are all part of the primary survey before the patient is transferred. Way to transfer. So this gentleman, the American surgeon, came up with the concept of golden hour. Though it has to this test of time, not evidence based. Still, he said that there is a golden hour between life and death. If you are critically injured, you have less than sixty minutes to survive. You might not die right then. It may be three days or two weeks later, but something has happened in your body that is irreparable. So the transfer policies our paramedics follow in India is that we transfer as soon as possible. And we just stop short of saying scoop and run is the best policy. Log rolling before transfer is must. It serves also the purpose to identify any injuries 
at the back at the same time. Ambulances, we have GVK MRI ambulances, we have the CAT ambulances in Delhi, we have the transport ambulances with, with, with just basic facilities, and we obviously we have the basic and advanced, advanced ambulances running Pan-India. Well, what about the courses of paramedics? The courses of paramedics have been in vogue for the last 12 to 13 years. So one course which I'm aware of is pre-hospital trauma technician course, which is run in Delhi at RML Hospital, Saptajang Hospital, and Lady Harding. So 30 candidates are enrolled every year and they undergo one year training before getting deployed. Just to show a word about injury prevention. So Haddon matrix as an example of a victim of a bicycle injury. So pre-injury, the victim person, you we need to train the adult super, uh, trained by adult supervision should take place. Agent vehicle, when we talk about agent vehicle, we can try and reduce the number and the speed. Environment factors improve visibility around school entrances. What about when the child has got injured? Helmet use is important. When we come to the agent, separating the vehicles and the cyclists. Environment factors, when they, we talk about injury, enabling the children to cycle on the footpaths. What about post-injury? Access to the first state. As a victim, when we talk about the agent, vehicle redesign should be thought of. And when we talk about environmental factors combining post-injury, we should think of access to health services. Take-home messages from my talk would be, we need to do a quick 10-second assessment to find any life-threatening conditions in airway, breathing, and circulation. We manage as we progress. In pre-hospital phase, exsanguinating hemorrhage, ABCDE is the approach. Hemorrhage control follows a proper algorithm. Remember the do's and don'ts of tourniquet. Never forget the cervical spine protection, pelvic binder, and splinting before transfer of the patient, log rolling as well, and transmic acid has stood its ground. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Vikas, for a very elaborative presentation on pre-hospital management of trauma. Uh, now I would request the Colonel Krishn Kumar, who is a senior advisor in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care, Army Hospital Research and Referral, Delhi Camp, New Delhi, uh, to share a screen and enlighten us on emergency room management of a trauma patient. Over to you, Colonel Krishn Kumar. Thank you, sir. Uh, uh, Colonel Vikas, tell us, can you please uh... Stop your screen, screen, uh, screen sharing. Is my uh, screen visible, sir? Yeah, your screen is visible, sir. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, uh, I'll be talking about, uh, first of all, uh, firstly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for giving an opportunity to speak on this, uh, on this emergency room management of a trauma patient. So, uh, as uh, rightly brought out in the previous class, uh, previous uh, speaker, that um, the trauma of epidemiology is there's almost one death every in every five seconds. And most of them are due to road traffic injuries, uh, which are more than combined with deaths due to malaria, tuberculosis, and HIV and AIDS patients. This is according to the recent WHO data, which is showing that road injuries are the, at the level of uh, at the seventh level at this stage, but it is uh, rapidly picking up its rank. <clears throat> if you see the model, a trimodal distribution of death, uh, the mortality is due to injuries is peaks in the differential into three peaks. The first one is which uh, first peak is the uh, happens within, within seconds to minutes, basically at the time of injury, we have overwhelming injury to the major organs such as brain, heart, and great vessels. And the only way forward is prevention of these injuries. And second peak is because it happens from minutes to several hours, and uh, most of the deaths are because of rapidly increasing intracranial hematomas, hemonemothorax, and major exsanguinating hemorrhages. And the tra basic uh, trauma care, whether the pre-hospital or intra-hospital, is the, directed to prevent secondary injuries because of hypoxia and hemorrhage. And the third peak happens days to weeks, 
is because of uh, due to sepsis and multi organ dysfunction, which is commonly seen in ICU or HDUs, where the patients succumb to the secondary health infections because of bacterial or uh, fungal infections. Mm -hmm. The main goals in ED is uh, they're all based on the concepts of trauma management as per the ATLS. Uh, they always treat the greatest threat to life first and never allow a lack of definitive diagnosis to impede the application of an indicated treatment. And a detailed history is not essential to begin the evaluation of a patient with acute illness. This is very important because we should not waste our time spending on what, what the diagnosis is. Uh, and taking a long, elaborate history so it should not be taken. They rather go into uh, analyze, the, uh, analyze the victim and treat the immediate, immediately the greatest threat to life first. The initial assessment is, of course, the time is crucial. As we already know, that's a golden hour concept. And there should be a systematic approach to assess the patient's conditions uh, very rapidly and accurately should be done. Uh, prior to uh, well, uh, arrival of victims, there should be preparation of the emergency department. There should be triage to be done to this, which is a mass casualties and multiple casualties. A primary survey has to be done, which has already been operated by the previous speaker, the ABCDs, and uh, adjuncts to the primary survey and dissertation. And consider the need of patient transfer if the if the holding case, if the hospital doesn't have the capacity to manage uh, uh, severe injuries, then it should be rather be shifted to a trauma center. And secondary survey uh, and head to toe evaluation in patient history has been taken at this time. And there are adjuncts to secondary survey and a continuous, continued post session monitoring and re evaluating this patient again and again because we should not go back, uh, we should not miss the findings. So uh, again and again, the ABCD remains the standard of care. We should uh, reevaluate the patient and do a secondary survey in this, in the uh, secondary survey. And of course, the definitive care, which happens in the uh, secondary survey. Preparation of the emergency department from trauma. There should be a designated area to receive all the trauma patients and resuscitate and stabilize according to the priority according to the triage which has been done. And there should be basic equipment requirements has already been discussed. There should be airway equipment, it should be readily and easily accessible to the person who is uh, going to uh, handle them. They should be readily available warm IV fluids. Again, uh, appropriate monitoring facilities should be there. There should be specialized provisions to be taken in case of uh, special groups of population like pregnant patients, pediatrics, and geriatric population uh, requiring special different kinds of size of tubes, like in the pediatric, and maybe an intraosseous needle for administration of IV fluids. And it is also uh, maybe uh, required necessary to improvise, improvise the things in remote areas where the limited resources are there. And there should be a method of to call additional medical assistance is required in these places. And rapid response team by the lab lab and radiology is very important because you have, now we have a primary adjuncts to the primary survey and secondary survey where the radiological investigation is a part and parcel of the management. And determine whether a patient needs exceed uh, needs exceed the resources of the facility or the, or the capability of the provider also. And arrange the patient transfer uh, agreements both inter and intra hospital with the verified trauma centers, and they should be operational in nature. The patients with multiple uh, injuries are best treated by well trained team. They, they sh they'll be have a team leader, and there's a trauma team which is there who are competent in assessing and treating the commonly seen life threatening injuries. In uh, limited resources uh, settings, there may not be adequate people, so in each, pe each person has to pay, uh, uh, play more than one role. Uh, and specialist did, uh, and the specialist did keep doing the assessment and intervention skills. And uh, it is, should be wherever possible, all the staff, trauma staff should be attending at least an ATLS course once, at least to have an, a knowledge of what, how, and uh, when to how to handle the cases. And always important to remember that all team members should wear gloves and plastic apron or an eye protection to prevent any bloodborne viral infections happening. Optimal care should be provided at all times during evaluation and dissertation and transfer process. The role of team leader is very important. He is the one who handles overall patient management. If there are multiple people are available, then he should do an hands-off approach to maintain an overview of the association. And he is the one who uh, uh, does the complete primary survey, ensures the complete primary survey and dissertation, and completes the second secondary survey, and recording and diagnosis of all treatment uh, given, which has been uh, be documented. And uh, uh, there are multiple people. There's allocating of specific tasks to different members of the team at an early stage. And it is usually before even the patient arrives to the trauma center. Advanced warning of arrival of a severely injured patient in emergency department enables the emergency uh, staff to assemble in the resuscitation well in time and handle the crisis. Uh, both the general surgeon and orthopedic surgeon should be the members of the trauma team. The objectives of the team is to identify and correct the life-threatening injuries, resuscitate the patient and stabilize the vital signs, determine the extent of other injuries and prepare the patient for a definitive care, which may even means transfer to the, another uh, trauma center, definitive center. The roles and responsibilities, uh, this is almost, this is a cartoon here, there are almost 10 people who are standing as a team leader, 
generally an emergency physician who controls and manages the session makes all the decisions prioritizes investigations and treatment the anesthesiologist who is on head end of the patient is responsible for assessing and managing the airway and ventilation and he also does the counting of initial respiratory rate administers oxygen by non non rebreathing mask uh, performs suctioning inserts airway junks like oropharyngeal airway or nasopharyngeal airway and even required in, uh, in definitive airway like using an endotracheal intubation by rapid sequence induction and intubation and it also maintains the cervical spine immobilization and controls the log rolling which has been discussed by the previous speaker and then the initial history called ample history is also taken which i'll be discussing in the subsequent slide what exactly is ample and uh, the ora the ot uh, ot to ovr the operating assistant or the ed nurse they also plays a role of air assistant assist in preparing the equipment for advanced airway intervention and applying required pressure if required and the doctor my uh, uh, one is emergency physician or surgeon and it takes a primary survey if it, if it is a catastrophic hemorrhage that takes a precedence even over the a and plus minus the, because airway is already taken over by the anesthetist the c and b goes to the next uh, b and a and b is already taken over by the anesthetist he controls the hemorrhage and the clinical findings are clearly spoken to the team leader and, and they are recorded by the record keeper and he performs the procedures depending on the skill level and training a doctor too which is standing on the left side of the patient he performs the procedures depending on the skill Uh, skill level and training, which may be an ICD insertion or pericardial synthesis, or uh, or maybe doing an diagnostic peritoneal lavage. The emergency nurse uh, who is standing next to the anesthetist, the ED nurse, applies monitoring and the ECG, uh, the SPO2 monitoring, the RT blood pressure monitoring will be applied to the patient and assist in advanced airway intervention. And us two who is standing on the on the left side of the patient, undresses the patient and assist in procedure. This is all happening. If you have multiple people who are there. And the entire entire sequence of airway, breathing, circulation, uh, the disability and exposure, everything happens simultaneously because the the the, the methodology is in horizontal approach. But if you are alone, a single person in a, in, a, in a small uh, district center or something, you might you have only one or two assistants. Then the the approach should be vertical approach. You should start with airway first, then go to breathing, then go to circulation, and subsequently, uh, so su subsequently the method management be done. Uh, then there's a record keeping has to be done. All the information which has happened, all the uh, diagnoses were made, has to, has to be documented because it's of medical legal importance. And all team members are responsible for ensuring that uh, the findings and decisions are correctly recorded. The uh, X-ray radiographer helps in X-ray and taking diagnostic X-rays, like especially the two X-rays. We need this, the chest X-ray and the pelvic X-ray. Uh, and the specialists who are there uh, in the helping the trauma team and undertake the secondary survey and advanced procedures. Like the general surgeon has to do a secondary survey from head and head to torso, and the orthopedic surgeon undertakes a secondary survey from limbs, pelvis, and spine. And uh, one bedside investigation, which is now uh, has taken over the beds, ultrasound point of care ultrasound, where you do focus assessment of sonography. I quickly will tell you whether there's an uh, intra-abdominal any collection is there. There's a triage that uh, happens in the emergency department in the ED. Uh, it's a process of prioritizing the patient, especially for mass casualty events. And it depends on where the where you are operating, where you are located. It could be a limited resource setting, or it could be a, a tertiary or a quaternary care center. It all depends on uh, the prior. The, the triage will be done accordingly. It is uh, again it is all based on the A, B, C priorities. And the factors that affect triage or uh, or the severity of the injury, the ability to survive, and available resources is very important because if you don't have adequate resources, it's difficult to triage all the patients because the, the capability is of the hospital may be lesser than the amount of number of patients who are received to the hospital. <clears throat> and uh, triage is uh, mainly required in multiple casualties or mass casualties. By definition, of multiple casualties, the number of patients on the severity of the in injuries they do not exceed the capability facility to render care. That is generally you see in in a quaternary care or a tertiary care center, or level one trauma center, which you see. And the mass casualties are the number of patients and the severity of the injuries does exceed the capability of the facility and the staff. So here, this the triage will be based on the uh, with whatever liquid uh, as uh, and the chances of survival are based on the uh, how fast you can minimal with minimal time with minimal equipment with minimal supplies and with develop the personal available how can how fast you can manage these casualties and then refer them to a subsequent definitive care hospital. The primary survey, which has been uh, discussed with the previous speaker, is the ABCDs airway with restriction of cervical spine motion. The breathing and circulation and control of hemorrhage, the disability of the neurological status, and E stands for exposure, undress, and environment is basically the con temperature control. The initial assessment is uh, generally follows an ABDC approach, but some recent article in uh, as well as in US military and UK military, they have 
started with the C, especially this is a catastrophic hemorrhage control, that catastrophic hemorrhage, that takes precedence even over airway because the patient can bleed to death. So hemorrhage has to need to be controlled, which has already been discussed by applicable tourniquet has applied the splint, available of the splint, form splint, etc. Uh, the aim is to identify all the immediate life-threatening conditions in the primary surgery and treat them before continuing even further surgery. The immediate life-threatening conditions are upper airway obstruction, there could be an open pneumothorax, there could be tension pneumothorax, severe plyal chest, massive pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, and an exsanguinating external hemorrhage. Any deterioration in patient general con clinical conditions should be managed by reassessing from the start of the protocol. If this one, uh, we've done not, this is basically not to miss uh, any important findings in the patient. A catastrophic hemorrhage is very important. Is This is already been discussed, so I will not talk about this applying of tourniquets and pressure bandages. And airway and spinal cervical spine control is again discussed uh, by the previous speaker, how we can do a cervical spine immobilization, manual lens uh, stabilization of the neck, and uh, uh, how to remove the helmet, etc. And indications for intubation, uh, the need for into airway protection is there for the patient unconscious, he's got a severe maxillofacial injuries, the risk of aspiration of blood and stomach contents, uh, risk of airway obstruction because of airway edema, less like in burns, neck hematomas, laryngeal or tracheal injuries, acute inspiratory strider and uh, upper airway burns. All this need an airway protection, so these patients, irrespective of whatever the saturation is, they should intubate and secure the airway. A need of ventilation and oxygen, patient is unconscious, no respiratory effort, uh, uh, respiratory effort is quite high, tachypnic, patient is hypoxic and hypercarbic, sinosis, there's a plyal chest, pulmonary contusion, blast injury, blast lung, uh, and to control the intracranial pressure by controlling the carbon dioxide in a severe closed head injury. Failed intubation is a very common problem which is seen in emergency departments. And one should not forget there's a lot of alternative devices that are available, like the supraglottic and extraglottic airway devices. And even if those fail, then one should consider an emergent or a surgical or a needle filter for it. The breathing, uh, next on the B part, they ensure adequate oxygenation, uh, oxygenation ventilation. Evaluate each part of the component of the uh, of the vent of the breathing, the lungs, the chest wall, and the diaphragm are the most important components. We need to look for any uh, lung contusions, there's uh, any hemothorax or open pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, or there's a uh, damage to the uh, diaphragm, there could be diaphragmatic rupture. All needs to be evaluated yes, uh, separately from you know, evaluating the breathing component. Expose the chest completely to look for obvious injuries. The respiratory rate is a very uh, sensitive indicator of physiological stress. Especially if the patient has got paradoxical breathing, it, it tells you there could be an underlying cervical cord injury. Check for the tracheal deviation, chest expansion on both sides. Perkers the lung FSS and auscultate the axillary. There's the same clinical examination of inspection, uh, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. And also do an examination of the backside of the chest and axilla in case of penetrating uh, in trauma, like in, especially in gunshot wounds. And administer oxygen always to, uh, always to patient by using high flow oxygen, that was six to eight liters per minute. Uh, by using Hudson mask, Hudson's mask or a non rebreathing mask. And uh, uh, if required, when one should even be able to do a back wall mask ventilation before prior to going to the rapid sequence induction intubation. The pulse oximeter, the SpO2, and the chest X ray are the part of the clinical, clinical examination in primary surgery. Thoracic injuries are uh, very important in uh, evaluating immediate life threatening because they are going to kill the patient immediately. They should be done in the initial primary survey. Uh, there should be, an, uh, like, especially like airway obstruction, tracheobronchial tree injury, tension pneumothorax, open pneumothorax, massive pneumothorax, and cardiac tamponade. They are going to kill the patient immediately. And there are certain potentially life threatening. Right? They may not be immediately kill the patient, but yes, a period of time, next 24 hours, whatever, they are going to kill the patient. They also need to be done in the secondary cell, like simple pneumothorax, a hemothorax, a failed flyal chest, or a pulmonary contusion, a blunt cardiac injury, uh, and traumatic aortic disruption traumatic diaphragmatic injury and a blunt esophageal rupture, uh, sternal rupture, sternal fractures, and all these clavicular fractures. These are all potentially life-threatening, which are generally assessed in the second, uh, in the second survey. Circulation, uh, this has already been discussed. Uh, the, the main step is to, in circulation is to identify, uh, is to uh, manage the shock and identify the shock. There could be early signs of shock, uh, especially uh, in, there could be uh, tachycardia, but tachycardia is not a good sign to rely on because uh, uh, in children, if it is more than 60, the heart rate is called tachy uh, tachycardia and more than 140 in a preschool child and more than 1 to 120 per minute in a school age child and more than 100 in adult is called as tachycardia. 
so heart rate may be even uh, difficult to uh, address, difficult to uh, you know clinically correlate well in especially in elderly patients who are on beta blockers or who are on cardiac pacemakers they where they have decreased catecholamine uh, sensitivity to the uh, to the heart in these patients and do not rely on even on systolic blood pressure because even the blood pressure can be a compensatory mechanism uh, for because, to, because of blood loss there could be a lot of sympathetic uh, drive which happens and bp may be slightly uh, may not be clinically correlating with shock shock is what is diagnosed on clinically itself so that's basically if you have any signs of inadequate perfusion to the skin basically if you measure in the capillary refill time if you see the kidneys they decrease you not put or the brain patient has got altered mental status these three are enough to they are like windows of the windows to the body basically to to say say that the patient has developed shock just look at the skin kidneys and the brain <laughs> the second step is to identify the possible cause of shock the shock could be because of hemorrhage it could be tension pneumothorax tamponade or could be neurogenic shock so this need to be evaluated the what type of shock is if it is not hemorrhagic then it has to be some non hemorrhagic shock that needs to be evaluated in hemorrhagic shock most common cause of death in in case of trauma is almost because of hemorrhagic shock the other shocks can be because of cardiogenic neurogenic and even septic shock and upset to shocks even the tension pneumothorax cardiac tamponade both contribute to upset to shocks so the american college of surgeons and the atls have given for classification of the four types of classes of hemorrhage and if you see in the class 3 is the loss of blood loss of more than around 1.5 liters 2 liters then only the systolic blood pressure actually starts dropping but even at less than that the bp remains normal so this is very important in uh, uh, in patients who have massive hemorrhage that even the bp may not be clinically correlated with the kind of a shock if patient has bled then we assume that patient is in shock the extent of hemorrhage need to be assessed uh, uh, on the patient physiology and anatomy or anatomy on the physiology needs to be identified and treated accordingly and when you have a, when you cannot identify the obvious bleeding then assess the site of blood loss there are something called one on the floor and plus four more that is basically there could be lot blood loss on the floor and there are the four different places where we need to look for it right one is in the chest uh, in the retroperitoneum uh, it could be intra abdominal or in the uh, or in the long bones basically so all this four needs to be thoroughly evaluated for looking for the source of bleeding if there is a pelvic instability this has already been discussed applying the uh, pelvic binder or by if there nothing is available you can even uh, use a bed sheet to uh, uh, to bind the uh, pelvis and extra chest and pelvis you know, and fast or, and even the dpl if there is no fast available diagnostic peritoneal lavage or recommended as a diagnostic modality is during the primary survey uh, the fast is a very good pick uh, as a tool which can be used bedside uh, because it's quite portable and it helps you in diagnosing Uh, there are four. Uh, there are four in fast and the extended fast. You can also look at the lung for hemothorax and pneumothorax. There are four different views. One is right upper quadrant view, the subcephaloid, the pelvic view, and left upper quadrant view. That quickly can within five minutes a trained person can quickly diagnose the, uh, uh, the diagnosis of the kind. There is an inter inter abdominal bleed is there. Diagnostic peritoneal lavage is not done routinely these days because of availability of the ultrasound at the bedside. But if it is done, if it is not, an ultrasound is not available, people are using DPL. and uh, it is considered as a positive if there is almost 10 ml of gross blood in the initial aspiration or if it is more than 500 uh, wbcs are seen or if there is a presence of uh, enteric or vegetable matter then it means as a uh, for for intestinal uh, uh, injury patients who are hemodynamically unstable with significant pre uh, intra abdominal fluid should immediately be taken up to surgery there should be laparotomy to be done if the fast is positive and the patient is hemodynamically unstable he should be taken up to surgery immediately If the patients who are hemodynamically stable, then they need to do an uh, CT imaging need to be done to identify the source of the bleeding. And it's very most important thing is a cardiac tamponade. Uh, there's a Beck's triad which has been mentioned, uh, where there's a raised JVP, there's a uh, drop in systemic blood pressure and muffled heart sound, but it is very very difficult in a trauma center which is very busy with a lot of noise around. Uh, with a lot of monitors which is making noise, it's uh, difficult to clinically uh, make a diagnosis of uh, cardiac tamponade. Ultrasound is a quick way of diagnosing it. If there's a hemoperitoneum, uh, one should do an immediate needle pericardiography and should be followed by a definite thoracotomy. Hemorrhage should also again need to be controlled, but it is important to uh, uh, manage this lethal triad of hypothermia, coagulopathy, and nephrosis because uh, because a lot of IV fluids will be given. There will be hemodilution. This uh, this part will be discussed here the, 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 regarding the coagulopathy by the next uh, by the third fourth speaker. So I'll uh, just skip this slide. 
EJV external jugular vein is a quick way of getting access. And if it is uh, in children, you can also use the in-process uh, needle. Uh, generally, when you find a time of insertion itself, if one should take a blood uh, for grouping and cross flushing and baseline hematological uh, uh, studies need to send the CBC and biochemistry should be sent. If it is a patient, is a female patient, pregnancy test need to be done, especially uh, to rule out preg uh, pregnancy uh, in this uh, uh, pregnant uh, population, this population. Tranexamic acid has already been discussed, uh, which is shown to be beneficial with a CRASH-2 trial which is published in the Lancet in, uh, in 2011. Uh, one gram IV over 10 minutes followed by an infusion of one gram over eight hours if it is given within three hours has shown to decrease mortality. And other than that, AVGs, uh, arterial, line, arterial line cannulation for the repeat, uh, frequent uh, blood, blood sampling and invasive blood pressure monitoring is appropriate. <laughs> fluids, again, uh, ring and lactate crystalloids are the, uh, are the fluid of choice. Uh, then again, one should be careful not to give excess of crystalloid because they can precipitate hypothermia, coagulopathy, and acidosis. And high chloride content in the crystalloids are again uh, shown to exacerbate the acidosis of shock. Uh, and if the fluids are kept at room temperature, they can contribute to hypothermia. Uh, it's important to understand that one, the aim of the resuscitation giving IV fluids is to restore the organ, organ perfusion. Uh, don't, do not give excess fluid because they can increase the hydrostatic pressure and, on the wounds and dislodge the blood clots. So uh, actually pursue the source of bleeding and control the bleeding by surgical means. And uh, the target blood pressure should be kept high, especially in patients who have uh, traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries. The map should be kept at 90 if one can use even uh, uh, fluids plus if required vasopressin. There are, uh, after giving fluids, a lot of, uh, some people don't respond. Some people respond, uh, what we call rapid respond, the responders, uh, the transient responders and patients with minimal or no responders. So, uh, these patients who are minimal or no responders, they, are, they require quickly a surgery, transient responders and uh, non-responders, they need surgery quickly to uh, control the by means of, uh, controlling the bleeding by means of surgical means. Management of massive hemorrhage, uh, there are a lot of uh, sensitive markers, like urine output, as has already been mentioned, the serum lactate, the base excess, and also use of uh, point of care uh, coagulation testing by using of thromboelastography as rotational thromboelastometry. Uh, one can use it to exactly guide your uh, blood component therapy. And consider early blood transfusion and rule out other causes of shock, like tension pneumothorax or a spinal shock. And aggressive and continued volume resuscitation is not a, a substitute for a definite control of hemorrhage. Always do a definite control of hemorrhage by using an angioembolization. One patient can be taken to uh, uh, intervention radiology lab and uh, by and then controlling the bleeding by embolization. Damage control surgery. Uh, this, the concept has originated by the U.S. Navy in uh, reference of uh, techniques in salvaging a ship. So this is mainly a uh, pain aim of the DCS in the primary should be if there's a massive hemorrhage, uh, patient requires surgery, they should be done. And the primary surgery should be even interrupted and continued post-operatively if required. That is mainly done in patients where there's a uh, bleeding in the intra-abdominal chest, pelvis, and long bones. The purpose of the five stages, five critical decision-making stages in the damage control surgery uh, was first and most important, the patient selection and decision to perform DCS. That's a decision to be done in emergency department. The second stage is uh, operation of the damage, on the damage control. The third stage takes place in the ICU where the patient is resuscitated towards normal physiology. And the fourth is a relook surgery or a definitive surgical procedure. And the fifth is a definitive closure of a body care. Advantage of DCS is the uh, surgeons are much, much more thorough in there. When the patient is more stable, they're able to do a better job. Hypothermia is very important. One should prevent and manage aggressively correct hypothermia because hypothermia is very dangerous. It can cause coagulopathy. Uh, it is recommended that you uh, remove the wet clothing of the patient, increase the ambient temperature of the, of the emergency department, force air warming, IV bond, IV fluids. All these things are given. Even the blood products and IV fluids which are given are to be warmed and then, then itself they will transfuse. If you don't have a warmer, microwave can be used, but blood, blood should not be kept in the microwave can, because it damages the cells. IV fluids can be kept in the microwave and then warmed and be given to the patient. Again, the, uh, regarding blood transfusion, the target hemoglobin is seven to nine grams per deciliter. If it is more than seven, one in one may not consider giving blood. If there's no blood available, no readily cross to a group, cross matched if blood is not available, one can consider giving a O negative blood, uh, especially in patients who are exsanguinating hemorrhage. And in pregnant female patients, it's important that they get, uh, if they're RH negative, they, uh, they should get immuno IV immunoglobulins, RH immunoglobulin therapy. Uh, controlling the massive hemorrhage, uh, again, as already mentioned, we can need to consider use of FFPs, platelets, and cryoprecipitate. 
if the fibrinogen is not available, one can consider one is to one is to ratio of red cells, FFP, and platelets. A target platelet count of uh, 75,000 is required. And uh, routinely monitor the INR. It is important to monitor the INR, uh, APTT, fibrinogen, and platelets. But if you have an advanced facility like using a ROTEM or a, a tech, it actually guides you, uh, uh, specifically, manage, specifically guides in management with this paglobin. <laughs> Calcium uh, is important again. INS calcium needs to be monitored during massive transfusion because of citrate toxicity. IV in calcium chloride to be administered during massive transfusion if there is uh, INS calcium levels are low by the reason of ABG or the ECG showing signs of uh, hypocalcemia. There's a prolonged QT interval if you see an ECG, the patient needs to be given IV calcium. <coughs> then uh, coming to the disability part, rapid neurological assessment is required. Basically, by GCS, this part has already been covered. But if you're not able to assess the GCS, at least one should consider do measurement of AVPU, that is alert, responding to voice, uh, responding to pain, and unresponsiveness. The patients with score P and U are generally uh, correspond to GCS of 8 by 15. So this need, patient need to be uh, the quick assessment, at least that uh, tells you that uh, before induction of anesthesia and intubating, uh, we should at least see this AVPU scoring if you're not able to do a GCS complete scoring of it. And always check blood sugar levels. It's again a part of the primary survey. Adjuncts to primary survey. The ECG, XPO2, carbon dioxide monitoring, assessment of ventilator rate, ABG measurements. Urinary cath two catheters uh, and uh, two X-rays are very part of the prime, uh, important part of the primary survey. Uh, the nasogastric tube, measurement of uh, X-rays, a chest and pelvis X-ray, serum lactate measurement, and bedside fast or e-fast if required. And consider the need for patient Is done, this unstabilization is done, this patient needs to be transferred to a better uh, trauma center, better care. Secondary survey is uh, uh, follows up. And taking an Dr. Krishan Kumar, uh, you are not audible. We have a connective uh, connectivity issue, I guess. Uh, uh, Dr. Suresh, will he be getting back to the presentation? Will it take time? Or we switch over to your presentation? Oh, so he's getting back. Okay, fine. I think that it's got discarded, I think. Okay. Uh, so you can uh, restart your presentation. Uh, okay. I don't know where it got disconnected. And the secondary survey, you were uh, discussing the secondary survey, head to toe examination. Okay, sir. Okay, sir. Yeah, this was the slide we got disconnected. Okay, sir. So, uh, uh, in secondary survey, they said imp uh, important to take the ample list basically regarding allergies and um, medications, the current use of the patient. Past illnesses and pregnancy, uh, and the last meal and events and environment related to the injury. <clears throat> and coming to head and neck uh, survey on second in head and neck, a mini neurological examination, the formal GCS examination to be done. A GCS of mild, uh, 14, to 14 to 15 is considered mild injury, moderate is 9 to 13, and a severe of 3 to 8. It is also part of the, uh, the revised trauma score. If the trauma revised trauma score is more than uh, four, then it's actually the patient can be uh, managed by, uh, by quite well in the primary center where you are managing. If it is less than that, the lesser the score, the higher is the requirement immediate to transfer this patient to the trauma center. The revised trauma score is basically consists of Glasgow trauma scale, the GCS, the systolic blood pressure, and the respiratory rate. 
the head and neck need to be thoroughly examined for wounds and signs of skull fracture. A different skull fracture may be uh, masked by overlying sc uh, skull hematomas, uh, but uh, they merit an urgent uh, CT and neurological consultation. And there are signs of skull based fracture like a fixed axis, uh, stages of rhinorrhea, osea otoria, uh, raccoon eyes, subcontinental hemorrhage with no, uh, hemoglobinpanum, battle sign, they're all signs of basically a skull based fracture. Prevent secondary or brain injury by maintaining the cerebral blood flow. Uh, by preventing hypoxia and hypercarbia and preventing hypertension and glucose control. And uh, coming to the cervical spine examination when the, uh, the cervical collar already been applied, uh, if the, this is uh, whether to remove the cervical cord and get an imaging, imaging to be done or, the, to be, or whether to remove the cervical cord, this nexus criteria which is given, uh, which is based on five important criteria. This is the patient doesn't have any midline uh, cervical spine tenderness. Uh, there's no evidence of intoxication. Uh, patients be conscious, alert. Uh, there's any no focal neurological deficit, and there should not be any associated other painful distracting injuries. That means the patient should not be having a pelvic fracture or a fracture femur that is getting distracting in assessment of the uh, cervical spine uh, because the pain might be higher in the cervical spine pain. So those kind of injuries should not be there. If all these five criteria meets, then the patient doesn't require any uh, X-ray or radiography or a CT scan. And if there are any one of them is present, that means patient needs to be evaluated by, uh, by the imaging. <laughs> Similarly, the Canadian uh, C-spine rule also says a similar kind of a thing. It also includes basically the age and what type of mechanism of injury, the dangerous, if it is a dangerous mechanism, if it is there, and if it is, whether it is a patient sitting restrained or not by motor vehicle accident, uh, um, or the patient is voluntarily able to actually rotate the neck, uh, they ask the patient to rotate. If any of them is not able to do it, then the patient requires C-spine mm -hmm. stabilization. Again, coming to the chest part and secondary survey, this has already been discussed in immediate life-threatening and potentially life-threatening. It's important to differentiate between these two, like immediate life-threatening and potentially life-threatening. Immediately life-threatening are to be addressed in the primary survey itself, whereas potentially life-threatening injuries like simple pneumothorax, hemothorax, arachnoid chest, pulmonary contusion, blunt cardiac injury, traumatic aortic disruption. It is not a, if it is an immediate complete rupture of the aorta, obviously the patient will not even reach the hospital. But is it is a, a, a transaction, partial transaction is of the endothelium or intimal, intimal layer, then when you can see in the chest x the widening of the mediastinum. All these are potentially there is a risk, but they are not to be they are not a part of the immediate life threatening injuries. Traumatic diaphragmatic injury and blunt esophageal rupture, so, uh, crush injuries, so the thoracic crush injuries, terminal fractures, they are all part of the evaluation to be done in the secondary uh, survey. And it is important to note in pediatrics, uh, though there will not be an obvious or an even imaging will not be showing uh, uh, refractors, these people develop, uh, these uh, children develop pulmonary condition. So it is uh, important to do a CT scan in them to look for this. Rather than X-ray, will not be very deceptive in this in this, in this population. And I think to be provided to them uh, by effectively by using interposition nerve blocks or thoracic epidurals, etc. And next, uh, in the abdominal part, again, hemodynamically compromised patient, it is important to take in direct the surgery. If it is hemodynamically stable, further evaluation needs to be done by CT imaging and by pelvic imaging. Traction has been discussed previously. Any presence of bruise or iliac vas, pubis, uh, labia, or the scrotum indicate there's a possibility of a uh, pelvic fracture. The commonest pelvic fracture is a lateral compression fracture. It's almost in the 60 to 70 percent, followed by an open book kind of a thing. Anterior posterior compression is almost 20 percent frequency. And the vertical shear is seen only 15 percent of The commonest is the lateral, which is because of the impact from the side. <coughs> Target in urine output of at least 0.5 ml per kg per hour in adults and more than 1 ml per kg per hour in children. Uh, unless the patient has got a rhabdomyolysis, a crush injury, then it should be targeted higher uh, urine output in these patients. Uh, macroscopic hematuria should thoroughly be investigated by using a contrast CT. And all females of childbearing age should have a urine pregnancy test to be done. And an intubated patient should have a nasogastric or a orogastric tube, uh, especially preferred to put an orogastric tube because if there's any suspicion of skull based fracture, but if it is not advised to put an in. Discuss uh, how to use tunic and uh, applying pressure dressings. In secondary dressing, it is important to uh, palpate the muscles to have an index of suspicion of compartment syndrome, especially in patients who are unconscious patients.
Uh, uh, Colonel Krishan Kumar, I would request you to kindly wind up your talk because we are already running behind schedule. Is my slide visible, sir? Yes, sir, it's visible. I would request you to kindly wind up as we are running short yeah, of yeah. time. Yes, yes, sir, I'm finishing. Is the screen visible now? Yes, sir, it is visible. It's visible yeah, to yeah, us, yeah. sir. I'm just finishing here. Yeah. The last two most two slides. Uh, okay. This is important also to provide analysis. I think this will be discussed by the, by the next speakers. Log rolling is also already been discussed. Uh, Edgings to the secondary survey. This is nowadays because available to easy available to CT scan, so CT to be done, a whole body CT uh, uh, to quickly evaluate the uh, source of the, the where the exact point, pinpoint the injuries. And the thorough re-evaluation need to be done thoroughly again to go back to the ABCD if the patient is deteriorating, so it should not waste any kind of immediate life-threatening injuries. <laughs> Take-home message is evaluate and dissociate of the major from a patient is a coordinated approach. It needs both well trained and uh, well rehearsed team, well, uh, especially the, with the team leader and the trauma team. Uh, and the process is a logical process. Start with ABCD, but you can move to see if it is a catastrophic image is there. Do the primary survey, treat the life-threatening injuries uh, as, uh, as, as well as they are found. And once the patient is uh, stabilized, the thorough secondary survey need to be carried out. From head to toe examination need to be done with further investigations and injury management. And patient to be dispatched to the appropriate area. If uh, they don't have a facility to handle it, then it should be patient dispatched to the better trauma center. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Krishan Kumar, for uh, an elaborate presentation on the ER management of a trauma patient. Uh, I would request our next speaker, Colonel Suresh Babu, who is a classified specialist in the Department of Anesthesia at Army Hospital Research in Vessel. And he's my batchmate from AFMC. We belong to the F2 batch. He has keen interest in trauma management as well as USD guided regional anesthesia. Over to you, Dr. Suresh, for your presentation on operating room management of a trauma patient. Yeah, uh, good evening, everyone. After the extensive presentation, uh, as anesthesiologists, we are all involved in management of uh, extensive trauma in our ORs on a regular and a frequent basis. My preamble for the talk is trauma patients are the sickest of the sick. Awareness of the patient's entire physiological and volume status is critical to successful management and outcomes. That's why the insight of complete uh, physiological and the critical volume of uh, blood replacements, et cetera, come into play. The necessity for ongoing recitation during induction and maintenance of anesthesia can complicate the management. Why uh, Suresh, trauma is important? Uh, your slides are not visible to us. Can you start sharing your screen, please? Yeah, can you, can you see it now? No, right now it's not visible to us. Can you see now? Yeah, can you switch over to uh, LightShow, please? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, it's visible. Please continue. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the important of trauma is they come as the sickest of the sick because already the parameters are compensated. Awareness of the patient's entire physiological and volume status is critical to successful management and outcomes. The necessity for ongoing recitation during induction and maintenance of anesthesia can complicate the management. Why injury and trauma is important? It's the leading cause of death between one to 45 years across the world. Anesthesiologists are involved in care of trauma patients in ED, resuscitations, OR, and in the ICU. Anesthesia for trauma, different from routine OR practice because most of the times it comes off working hours where a hands are less, limited resources, limited patient information, most of them with full stomach, C-spine immobility, and occult injuries. Trauma anesthesia is a separate entity, uh, especially in the West, and it's coming up in India because the role of pre-hospital setup, 
sedation and analgesia in the accident and emergency, already drugs would be given. The ongoing hemodynamic resuscitation since the onset and, and uh, evacuation and uh, the early associated coagulopathies it, it carries. Pre-operative optimization and ventilatory strategies are different. The ICU, ICU monitoring for class three and class four trauma and rehabilitation and pain management in the, in the uh, long term. Anesthesia technique depends upon the neurological condition, cardiovascular stability, coagulation status, and type of duration of surgeries. Consideration is analgesia and sedation in the emergency room and diagnostic procedures. Regional techniques are preferred in trauma patients. Role of sedation, whether warranted or not. The anesthetic management, depending upon the type of injuries. The preparation of the OR, because you want multiple uh, uh, help in terms of equipment and hands. Hemodynamic management in the trauma patients. Critical care management in the polytrauma and chronic pain following trauma. The primary goals are always airway management, hemodynamic st stability, the various shocks associated with it and management of it, coagulopathy, hypothermia, and electrolyte acid imbalance because most of the, uh, I mean to say it, once it happens in the highways, it takes time for the patient to be evacuated. Provide immediate pain relief and honorable block, on arrival block, maintenance of nomothermia, lung protective ventilation, maintain adequate cerebral blood flow and secondary injury, especially if it's a CNS injury. The airway management, the challenges associated with injuries, maxillofacial burns, penetrating neck injuries, difficult airway and difficult airway associated with worsened pre-existing difficult airways, C-spine injuries, surgical airways when required, spinal cord injury, blood secretions, tissue edema, full stomach, all this can complicate our anesthesia management. And especially if it is a tracheal injuries, it's very difficult for intubation. The BILS protocol as elucidated during a laryngoscopy, very important. Intubation and hard cervical corner if required. Avoid nasotracheal intubation because of skull-based fractures. Difficult airway cut always to be ready. FOB, video laryngoscope with different blades. Laryngoscope with various size blades. Surgical cricotherapy sets adjuncts, airways, and second-generation supraglottic airway devices, and if not, tracheostomy set, and always a transtracheal jet ventilation. Uh, this is an injury which has happened in the, uh, last week in a forward location. And uh, this is an important slide because you have the plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, whenever we, have, we, man we are managing a, a trauma. The first is uh, direct laryngoscopy, mostly in a trauma it uh, seldomly, really, I mean to say, it's not very easy. Next, always a VL should always be kept in mind. Plan C is a uh, supraglottic airway, and the last is surgical. The anesthetic implications is hypovolumia, hypovolumia should always be kept in mind. The uh, various cardiac feeling pressures, which can cause myocardial ischemia, decrease. Decrease, him, I mean to say, cardiac filling pressures, ioto cable compression leading to hemorrhagic shock, hypoxemia, increase FRC, decrease buffering capacity of the increase of oxygen consumption, fear of increased incidence of reflux and aspiration in a full stomach, upper abdominal and penetrating injuries associated with blunt trauma and uh, uh, blood loss, glucose and electrolyte complexes, and hematological abnormalities in terms of anemia, internal bleeding, thrombomelic disorders, infections. Monitoring and intravenous access. Always, it, it's a, a 16 gauge or larger blood uh, venous, intravenous access. Central access is if, if there's an uh, uh, opportunity and with the ultrasound available, it's an easy uh, task. Next is invasive arterial line, helpful for uh, bit to bit variation. Next is the blood gas analysis and uh, one investigation which is preferred in a trauma patient is ABG because it gives you hemoglobin, lactates, the completed dynamic of uh, uh, hematological and the pulmonary uh, parameters. Yeah, the uh, ACS, this is the American College of Surgeons, importance of blood and blood products to be always ready, uh, class three, class four, where uh, blood is transfused. Hemodynamic instability, uh, target is 
improve perfusion of pressure, oxygen delivery, active bleed is supported with damage control surgery, arrest of the surgical control bleed, addressing permissive hypotension, post hemostasis, higher BP may be ta uh, targeted. Administer fluid and blood products, dynamic parameters to assess volume status in terms of uh, <clears throat> bedside echo, uh, TE if available, and the respirophasic variation in arterial waveform during positive pressure ventilation. Current ATS guidelines warrant not more than one, warm, one liter warm saline prior to the products. Administer blood products in ratio of uh, one is to one of uh, RBC, uh, FFP, and platelets. Whole, whole blood, if available, superior to product transfusion. Fibrinogen supplementation, if available. Intraoperative laboratory test guide and point of care like TEG and Rotem. Consider recombinant factor in severe bleeding and always um, it is, be our emphasis to prevent the lethal uh, complications of lethal triad. If there's an intraop blood salvage system available, we should use it. Antifibrinolytic administration in absence of POC coagulation test. Electrolytes all because of acidosis, hypocalcemia uh, because of massive transfusion, damage control resuscitation in trauma patients to control hemorrhage, contamination, and temporary abdominal closure. Identify the other causes of shock available if focus is available. Most of our level one hospital, major hospital focus is available. E-fast is always recommended. MTP in trauma is initiating factors a pulse more than 120, such systolic blood pressure less than 90, positive EFARs, penetrating torso trauma injuries, score more than two warrants, MTP activation, persisting hemodynamic instability, and ongoing bleed requiring surgery or embolization. Another uh, important slide with the confirmed red flags where immediate action is warranted in terms of blood transfusions. Point number two is discuss and for uh, rapid sequence intubation, thoracostomy, Thoracotomy, our application of pelvic and long bone swings. If it is delayed, delayed, blood product resuscitation, closely monitor for evolving red flags. If you see on the left side, the mechanism of injury can uh, enable us to uh, opt for which, is, which of this one, two, three has to be required. ABG, it gives you lactate based deficit and rotum and tech, if available, it gives you what type of product to be uh, transfused. The endpoints for massive transfusion are hemoglobin more than 10, PT less than 18 seconds, platelets more than 150 lakhs, TEG, the various values associated with blood products and ABG are the cornerstones of uh, uh, good OR management plasma cryofibrinogen concentrates. Uh, acute coagulopathy of trauma shock, a multifactorial hypercoagulable state, hypoperfusion, hypoperfusion causing acidosis, increase in protein C, Exemption, decrease in plasminogen, and the injury severity score more than 25. Always look for the pH of acidosis, hypothermia to be avoided, hypotension to be avoided, and 98%, there's always a, a, th a threat of developing coagulopathy. The DCS, uh, the four, four uh, indicators, absolute indication for damage control surgery, where a surgeon, once we get an information that there is a major trauma, the sur surgeon is always prepared for a DCS, Accordingly, our theater should be prepared. Resuscitation, maintain normothermia, correct acidosis, vasopressors and inotropes always to be the uh, infusion stand to be ready. The lung protective ventilation to be kept in mind because of uh, hemothorax, pneumothorax, or uh, blood in the lungs. Patient to be immediately shifted to the OR from ED. Preparation of ED temperature to be maintained in 26 to 28 degrees. Ensure presence of adequate fluids, essential drugs, blood and blood products, cell saver, a life saver, post hot air warmer or a bear hugger, transport patient with supplemental oxygen with proper monitors, ensure C, C spine is clear ma, or neck stabilized. General anesthesia is most of the times preferred. Agents with minimal hemodynamic effects are opted. Lower volume of distribution of IV agents. Dose should be titrated to the response. Etomidate in a hemodynamically unstable, but uh, the fear of uh, adenocortical suppression to be kept in mind. Favorable effect on cerebral blood for CMRO2 at dose of 0 0.25 milligram is recommended. Ketamine, always in severe hypotension. Consider vasopressors or inotropes. Rapid sequencing intubation with uh, succinylcholine or rocroline. 
the this is the chart where uh, etomidate remifentanil remifentanil so uh, coming to india so yeah gastric decompression wherever feasible try to try to try to rate volatiles to maintain systemic arterial pressure more than 65 consider volume resuscitation to prevent collapse avoid nitrous oxide high dose of op opioid supplementation in chosen when post op ventilation is planned tranexamic acid uh, recommended post op consideration is careful transport to the icu organized handover to the icu staff reassessment of unresolved shock correction of respiratory metabolic immunological sequence of trauma reassessment of any missed injuries control ventilation till correction of the hemodynamic parameters electrolyte coagulation abnormalities and prevent secondary tissue injuries especially in the cns and myocardial here yeah, regional anesthesia uh, is catching up in uh, especially in extremity traumas diff uh, difficult consent due to impaired uh, consciousness or judgment the on arrival block concept use of ra in impaired consciousness may aggregate uh, nerve injury optimal position is, is difficult resuscitation is more life saving than blocks Under underlying coagulopathy or unclear medical history puts at risk of hematoma following neurological procedures insufficient ev evidence in safety of tnbs uh, peripheral nerve blocks in patients on anti on anti plates or uh, newer newer oral anticoagulants nerve injury increases the theoretical concern of permanent damage increased risk of infections and compartmental syndrome to be uh, kept in mind it does not affect the airway patency attenuates stress response no interference with neurological status facilitates patient positioning and painful procedures patient transport patient transport and improves blood flow because of the sympatholysis provides greater patient comfort reduced risk of opioid tolerance positive impact on chronic pain and reduced post op delirium and reduced icu and hospital stay this was a patient which we received in our hospital and you see on the right side uh, the importance of a block and how comfortable and uh, both the providers are uh they are extending the complete pressure but patient is extremely comfortable it's the same patient which we had block take home message is trauma should be managed in networks with major trauma center as the hubbard spoke model anesthetists provide a key role from point of injury to rehabilitation dcr underpins initial patient management in major trauma severely injured in intensive care are at risk from sepsis and multi organ failure robust audit and governance structures need to be placed in severely injured to assess outcomes and improve standards formation of medical emergency teams or quick reaction teams or medical emergency uh, response teams to facilitate the provision of care near to an incident thank you very much thank you colonel suresh uh, our next speaker is colonel aditya joshi he is a senior advisor in department of anesthesia and critical care at army hospital delhi can uh, sir will enlighten us on the icu management of a trauma patient uh, his key areas of interest are hemodynamics sepsis extracorporeal therapies and ards and he has certain publications and awards to his credit he has got the chief of army staff commendation as well as eastern army commander commendation over to you colonel aditya joshi sir Can you unmute yourself, sir? So you are not audible. Your slides are visible to us, but you are not audible. So we are not able to hear you, sir. uh sir we cannot hear you sir i think you are having any network glitch you can leave the room and join once again sir
am i audible now yes sir okay uh, good evening i am uh, not going to take much time as the patient has now come alive uh, to the icu after uh, uh, going through the pre hospital phase and the uh, emergency department as well as the <coughs> operation theaters so the handover being the most important part of the start of the care of the patient uh, we need to communicate before we receive the patient and in this era of increased communications we can also get whatever imaging that has been done till now and the sequence of events so the history taking and uh, talking to the relatives as well as the surgeons or the emergency department staff who have been involved gives us an idea of what to expect when we receive the patient and immediately on receiving the patient we look at ongoing threats to life so anything that may have deteriorated during this phase what kind of surgery has been done uh, was it damage control or was it uh, definitive surgeries and at the same time the goals of care uh, need to be discussed is this still a saveable patient sometimes for all you may know the patient is now by now brain dead but the organs are there so further goals of care towards uh, the uh, uh, organ donation sometimes or in extremes of age uh, the trauma is just too much so those things may be there in the icu and a detailed sequence of events of whatever has happened uh, is again recorded and what phase of resuscitation is the patient currently under and this goes on for both uh, iv fluids as well as blood products as well as other uh, uh, diagnostics and therapeutic interventions that we need to do as we all know in terms of the fluid therapy we can have phases of resuscitation optimization stabilization and then evacuation uh, similarly the sosd concept of salvage optimization stabilization and then de escalation and once we have completed a handover and addressed any ongoing threat to life we do a complete tertiary uh, survey for again any missed injuries because although like the other speakers have said about primary and secondary survey there can always be a chance of missed injuries many common missed injuries are uh, in pan facial fractures you may have ophthalmic injuries in neck injuries there may be some tracheobronchial issues uh, diaphragmatic ruptures in chest trauma uh, a retained hemothorax in spite of playing uh, putting an icd is possible so uh, and retroperitoneal hemorrhages may uh, be initially not seen but once the volumes increase these may come in compartment syndrome developing later on or a neuroascular issue coming up later are all possibilities so these things are missed injuries and again we go by the sequence of events just like abc so airway and ventilation look at all the tubes lines drains catheters placed and then reassess all orifices and focus on circulation the ongoing phase of resuscitation as we said and we now systematically and scientifically look at the determinants of oxygen delivery so right from the hemoglobin the cardiac output the uh, peripheral microcirculation the organ damage uh, any organ damage ongoing and need for any additional monitoring additional diagnostics and again as i said missed injury additional monitoring mostly is hemodynamic monitoring although like we said most of one likely they would have arterial uh, access so now we can go in for goal directed therapies using that or you may have uh, uh, advanced monitoring uh, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, cardiac direct cardiac output continuous cardiac output monitoring and use of uh, you know, the esophageal trans esophageal echocardiography so these are the things that may be addressed many a times endoluminal injuries uh, in patients or uh, injuries to the vascular system may require interventional radiology support so the assessment is also done for that many a time when we are uh, then ongoing uh, stabilizing the patient and resuscitating the patient 
the various organ systems that are involved in trauma, they may have competing problems. So in ventilator strategy, for example, the patient may have already gone into ARDS or has pulmonary contusions. So the standard uh, ARDS ventilation set settings may be required. But at the same time, the patient may have a traumatic brain injury. So you will have a competing problem of if you give high peeps and recruitment maneuvers, it can cause uh, rises in ICP. Permissive hypercapnia can cause a rise in ICP. So you have to then mix and match your strategies so that the lungs are also protected. There is no barotrauma. At the same time, the ICP is also managed. Whenever we are escalating the ARDS management, uh, we have to decide how do we escalate. Croning may be in fact disastrous if the uh, trauma patient has very poor compliance and uh, uh, bony fractures or an abdominal compartment syndrome, a very stiff abdomen. So uh, nowadays, uh, more and more uh, patients we are considering for ECMO, even in trauma. Uh, because of the fact of the fear of coagulopathy and ongoing bleeding, uh, ECMO programs initially would not offer uh, polytrauma patients the, this strategy. But uh, more and more better uh, point of care testing of coagulation, now we are uh, finding that, yes, we can offer ECMO as ongoing salvage for then um, addressing the issues at a later time. With regards to fluid therapy in ongoing uh, management in the ICU, the points have already been uh, covered, so I won't go too much into it. But yes, we must have goal-directed uh, assessments, and we use uh, echocardiography using the VTI, the velocity time integral, looking at the aortic outputs, uh, the LV outflow. Uh, that is a good marker, uh, which we can use to direct uh, the uh, the fluid uh, therapy, other markers of the microcirculation like lactate clearance, the base deficit have already been covered. So need for transfusions, the massive blood transfusion protocol may still be active. So in the ICU, it may continue and then you decide when to stop it. And the adjuncts have already been uh, discussed. I would like to add to the adjuncts, uh, the availability of now prothrombin complex concentrates. Uh, which FDA approval is for uh, warfarin-induced bleeds, but uh, in polytrauma, off-label use has started. When you want rapid correction, instead of fresh frozen plasma, you can use prothrombin complex concentrates like FIBA or Octaplex. And recombinant factor 7 alpha has already discussed. What happens after the initial resuscitation phase is the development of trauma-induced coagulopathy. And this may include both the cause uh, uh, a hyperfibrinolysis, which we try to uh, address by use of tranexamic acid, but there can be a total loss of uh, fibrinolysis also and impaired uh, thrombin generation. So we have to have point of uh, care testing to look at that uh, because of uh, polytrauma and the activation in the endothelium of uh, protein C. So the activated protein C uh, is, uh, has a big role in both innovation of the clotting factors and enhancing the fibrinolysis. You have a blockage of the activated factor 8, blockage of uh, uh, activated factor 5, as well as uh, the uh, exacerbation of plasminogen, uh, plasminogen activation inhibitors, which leads to consumptive coagulopathy more degradation of the clot, the clot, the clot quality is poor, and this can exacerbate the trauma-induced coagulopathy. An example of the rotten system uh, popularized by the German um, uh, Association of Trauma Surgeons, the EAST guidelines, they use rotem, and this is an example of uh, various blood products uh, used on the base of the XTEM and the FIPTEM uh, traces, wherein you can uh, uh, use various products according to the Rotem diagram. With specific issues to various organ systems, uh, brain, uh, we have to sometimes initiate the tired therapies for ICP management. So in traumatic brain injury in tertiary centers, the standard of care is to actively monitor the ICP and use uh, tired one, tired two, tired three therapies to manage uh, rises in ICP that may include decompressive craniotomies also. Uh, chest, again, uh, to uh, look for retained hemothoraces, 
early fixation of the ribs, early tracheostomy uh, in the ICU, all these benefit patients in the long run in trying to wean them off. In the abdomen, if the uh, patient has undergone damage control su uh, surgery, we have to actively look for development of the abdominal compartment syndrome. And this includes uh, uh, active monitoring. Many a times uh, the abdominal injuries may be managed conservatively. So then again, further bleeding will cause abdominal compartments that, that may require drainage and uh, use of the urometer to also monitor the abdominal uh, pressures is a uh, standard of care. Also look for traumatic pancreatitis, any increase in the retroperitoneal bleeds, development of nerve entrapments, intraocular pressures, patient may have concomitant spinal shocks, and urological injuries can also be missed that may require intervention by stenting, etc. Ongoing uh, survival of the patient, one must then start taking care of the patient on a day-to-day -day basis. And these involve bundles of care for prevention of various complications like DVT, ventilator-associated pneumonia, infections, which are the major killer. And here, antibiotic stewardship is very important. And daily bundles like awakening the patient, spontaneous breathing trials of the patient, delirium management, proper analgesia, and family involvement and empowerment of the patient as well as the families. Nutrition, obviously, early enteral nutrition within the first 24 hours, uh, if possible. If not, we assess the nutric uh, scoring and initiate early uh, parenteral nutrition. Uh, these uh, aspects are very important for prevention of chronic issues and catabolic states. The immunity is suppressed uh, in the chronic uh, phase in the ICU, so that also needs to be taken care of. Regional anesthesia, as was spoken by Karan Suresh, is underused, probably because of poor training in our country and we overestimate the risk. So ideally in the ICU, we must reassess and any uh, uh, addition to the analgesic plan will always be better. As I was saying about the development of chronic issues, the most important uh, fact after the early uh, survival is development of persistent inflammation and catabolic syndrome. And this uh, happens in many uh, uh, cases of severe trauma, even uh, sepsis or pancreatitis, burns. And the main problem is this is progressive immunosuppression and the tendency to develop new infections. So active search for infections and uh, adequate nutrition is the key for getting the patient out of this indolent course. Uh, the main pathophysiology of development of PICS is uh, activation of what are known as myeloid-derived suppressor cells. Uh, these are, uh, because of uh, major trauma, they get activated and they have beneficial effects like uh, release of nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species and cause phagocytosis. But over a period of time, they have immunosuppression, chronic inflammatory state, and poor wound healing. So how do you break the vicious cycle? As I stress again on enteral nutrition, high protein supplementations, daily assessment of nutrition, various um, uh, products like arginine and uh, anabolic hormones, they have been tried, but no evidence. Uh, inspiratory strength training, physiotherapy and mobilization are the key uh, to take uh, this patient out of the ICU. And that has to be actively pursued as easy as as early as possible. So uh, that would end my uh, uh, talk. I would uh, request the moderator to please uh, take over. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay. So I have a couple of questions. Uh, first question is for Dr. Vikas. Yes, please. Uh, you mentioned about paramedic training. Do you see a difference in training in defense as well as civil? I, I foresee that defense structure is much more organized as compared to civil. Yeah, the defense mind? training, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, so defense training keeps happening at various places, but yeah, so the job at our place and all over India Whichever place we get posted or we go on temporary duties, 
Our job is to, you know, it's evolve, it's evolving kind of a thing because people come new and rotate every day business. So, for example, if I'm looking after the emergency department, so people rotate and the capsule course is run for them routinely. So, what I'm trying to say is that the 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 and beyond that, the what is called as uh, you know um, the practice sessions. So, called what is it called? Practice sessions. Mock, mock drills. The mock drills take place very frequently. So they are told that in case tomorrow they are going to receive a mass casualty or multiple casualties, so what will be done? But uh, yeah, so that is what is the difference. I think it's you are right that it's slightly more organized than what uh, yeah it's, it, it happens uh, in the civil arena. And also we are able to do the audit at the same time, if I may say so, that... Uh, because it is being assessed by the higher officials and they come and, uh, you know, they rate you how well or how uh, good or bad was the disaster management, for example. Okay. Uh, Colonel Vikas as well as Colonel Krishn Kumar, both of you stressed upon the role of tranaxonic acid. So what is the ideal time where it should be given in the pre-hospital scenario or once the patient arrives to the ER? Yeah. And... Any contraindications to its use in the setting of trauma, if you can enlighten us on that? Any one of you? Uh, I don't think there's any contraindication is there. But if a patient is actually bleeding, they're recommended as for the trial, the transfer trial, so give it as early as possible, less than three hours. Okay. Give one gram bolus and then followed by, if required as infusion, to be given every eighth hour list. There is not enough evidence to give it beyond three hours. In fact, some studies do say that after three hours, if we give, it increases the mortality. So, okay. routinely, uh, the base hospitals in higher up places, they receive the patients when transmic acid would have already, already been given. So, that thing is uh, definitely taken care of. And uh, uh, notwithstanding, transmic acid being used by, by not only uh, you know, the, the trauma people, it is being used by a wide variety of uh, specialities just for the properties of being antiphenolytic. You know what I mean. So what I can uh, understand is defense sector is much more organized in terms of managing trauma. Within three hours, if you can administer injection tranaxamic acid, I am not sure whether our civil side would be able to deal with the same scenario. So can we have the take-home message like after three hours, if we receive the patient, uh, we should not be using tranaxamic acid or still there is a window we can use tranaxamic acid? There is a window, to... but you have to be in, con in consultation with the, with the, with the higher-ups and things like that. But generally, it's admitted within three hours because evidence clearly shows that the mortality would decrease if given within three hours and not later. Okay. So, uh, it will depend on the... If you still feel that if the, your tag and rotum is showing that there is a license happening, then I think you still got a role in uh, tranexamic acid. Especially if you have a point of care testing is available as, uh, for coagulation testing like a tag or rotum. So that might still have a role. I don't think it is should be completely disbanded. But based on a clinical evidence, yes. And uh, you mentioned, uh, Dr. Krishn Kumar, the role of... Uh... Uh, regional anesthesia in ER. At what stage do you think that regional anesthesia should be given once the secondary survey is complete or the primary survey? What are the current recommendations if you have to choose a regional anesthesia technique for a particular patient for pain relief? The primary survey is to be made sensitive that the airway breathing situation has to be that is a priority and treat the life most life threatening uh, injuries has to be treated. There is subsequently, yes, in secondary survey only all this, uh, uh, with and this is like, otherwise we have parental opioids initially to manage pain, uh, but if you want to go ahead with say, dramatic campaign, especially it is more useful in upper limb and lower limb injuries. So in that case, uh, regional anesthesia has got a role, but not in primary survey, definitely. Uh, Colonel Suresh, uh, at times you might be getting patients directly from the ER, yeah. at, time, at times from the yeah. ICU. Yeah, uh, what happens in, in our setup is, always two theaters are ready. One is for the cesarean, second is for the trauma. The trauma theater is always equipped with all the devices, equipments, drugs. So 
It is that before the patient is shifted, the consultant anesthetist is already reached the theater. The duty drills are also set saying that equipment for cesarean, equipment for trauma. So we are ready to handle trauma cases at a short notice. Okay. So my question is, there would be scenarios where the patient is already intubated either in the ER or intensive care unit. Or there might be a scenario when you are supposed to intubate in the operating room. So what is the drug of induction agent of choice in such cases? Yes, it depends upon the clinical status. Whether the vital parameters, if they are optimal, you go for the normal. If I mean to say if there's hypotension, you opt for a drug which increases the AP. If suppose there is a, a cardiac parameters and not, you prefer etomidine. So it depends upon the clinical condition. So, but uh, Kanal Suresh, etomidate is said to cause some degree of adrenocortical suppression. Yes. So don't you think uh, this would cause actually a harm to the patient, although this is a single dose? Yeah. Uh, we have been using this drug extensively for the last couple of years. In a trauma, less normal OT patient is high. I have not, uh, we have not witnessed it. Probably it's a documented uh, adverse effect. But it is a very safe, stable drug which gives you that window period of maintaining the optimal hemodynamic parameter status. Uh, I have a question for Colonel Aditya Joshi. You made a very important statement that patient has come from the operating room alive to the intensive care. At times, in an urgency situation, there would be situations that the primary survey would have missed some injury. So what as intensivist, you take care that once you receive this patient, you do again a primary or a secondary survey or what tips can you give us as an intensivist that uh, one should be careful once the patient has been shifted out from the OT to the intensive care for further management? Absolutely. And the first and foremost, likely makes effective communication between teams, which helps us uh, know at what stage are we receiving the patient. And priority wise, first and foremost, means be the end. So the airplane may require proper structuring, securing, all those things are confirmed first. Then, assimilation, many a times. Uh, the uh, patient may have been extubated on danger, but by the time the patient is shifted to the ICU, new issues have come around. And they have been situations uh, that uh, an early extubation trial may have been given, but uh, by the time you reassess, either because of less injuries or because of uh, further deterioration, the patient may require a re we always remember that these re-intubations are more difficult or any escalation <laughs> towards a tetrosomy or an uh, advanced age is a difficult anatomy and physiological case. So first and foremost, priority remains that. Similarly, continue the uh, three surveys. What it means is whatever has been missed in the primary and secondary And we have better use of technology and time. So we use multidisciplinary care in which endoscopy, cardiology concerns for looking at transition schedule, echocardiography, uh, interventional radiology support. So these things we organize to look for anything that we can miss or probably the primary trauma, uh, which was uh, uh, other injuries were there. Now they are going to be important on the So this is an ongoing process. Uh, I when you when I heard your presentations, all of you mentioned the role of point of care ultrasound, be it in ER, be it in operating room, or be it in intensive care. So if you actually compare the last 15 or 20 years since you actually started practicing, or maybe prior to that, how has the point of care ultrasound or ultrasound as such revolutionized the management? of trauma, be it ER management or OR room management or intensive care management. Any one of you would like so to I share their view? I will also add a question. 
it has absolutely revolutionized uh, the because of the fact that we are answering only specific questions which save time. Drama follows till the path of the golden art principle. So, the more time you save, whether it is shifting the patient to radiology, whether taking expensive diagnostic imaging, point of view helps solve immediate problems. This is not to take the bleeding uh, blind from an abdomen to the lower directly, the fast health system, immediate treatment of ICDs or uh, uh, debating patients because of uh, new, uh, uh, sorry, uh, or uh, any uh, traumatic discussion, taking a surgical area. So, point of care of some gives us quick decision making skills so that we save time for the urgent life threatening uh, intervention. And then, point of care uh, testing to look for immunologic targets. As I said about cardiac output monitoring, uh, we can repeatedly do uh, non invasive tests like uh, using the PLR method to look at the VTI changes in echocardiography. So it's, it's actually revolutionized our approach to uh, resuscitate the patient and to stabilize the patient. Uh, so I think it is, it is uh, very cheap, easily available, and it is repetitive. If you want to do multiple times, if you want to do it, or maybe a plan or you can do it. CD is a snapshot, it's just only a tether movement what's happening in there. So, so obviously, uh, obviously, the uh, other is possible. Even if it's fast, you know, it's a little only 10 to 10 um, amazing. If you do it, typically anybody can pick it up. It's not a big deal about it. So, Definitely, it has revolutionized our practice in both in critical care as well as in emergency medicine. It will be, it will definitely stay in, I think, it will only get better and better. Uh, <clears throat> Dr. Radha Krishnan, sir, any uh, question from your side? Sir, you are not audible. Uh, in that case, uh, I would like to thank all the panelists, Colonel Vikas Chavla, Colonel Prashant Kumar, Colonel Suresh, Colonel Aditya Joshi, for uh, sparing their valuable time for enlightening us on this trauma anesthesia webinar. And I'm thankful to ICA for giving me this opportunity to moderate this session. So over to Dr. Sanish for the concluding remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Devesh for organizing this um, excellent session for uh, Indian College of Anesthesiology ICA webinar. So we had a very good panel of experts uh, who had authentic uh, lecture as well as a good interactive session. Um, extremely thankful to you to bring, for bringing in a, a good panel. Thanks, uh, Colonel Vikas Chawla, Colonel Krishna Kumar, uh, Lieutenant Colonel K. Suresh Babu. Uh, Colonel Aditya Joshi for your uh, time and expertise for ICA webinars. We look forward to having you in our uh, future endeavors also, because uh, this video is going to be in the YouTube and uh, I think it will be a much sought after session among ICA webinars. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have a few more sessions lined up next week. Uh, a reminder, we have a uh, masterclass series starting session one on cardiomyopathy and uh, beyond that uh, May 31st will be our landmark 150th session of ICA webinar where we'll discuss modern anesthesia workstations. It's going to be an interesting one because it's uh, based on a collaborative learning and we are exploring technology uh, helping us in anesthesiology management. We are getting a video demonstrations shot in different institutions across the globe and getting all the experts uh, helping us in bringing uh, the content well for a good panel discussion. It's going to be interactive as well. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good night, everybody. And uh, thanks once again for this expert panel for your uh, excellent contribution for uh, this session. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Dr. Sanish, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank, you. thank you. Good night to everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Shraddha. Good night, sir.